Good evening, this is Quintus Curtius, and welcome back to Fortress of the Mind. And we're going to talk tonight a little bit about a subject that involves the idea of hitting back hard against your opponents, hitting back hard against the enemy, the other side, or the opposing party. And this is something that everyone in this life is going to need to master if they really want to get where they need to be. Because you aren't going to get where you need to be if you simply sit in a supine position and accept the role that's been doled out for you by circumstance, by fate. That's a recipe for disaster. And I've talked about this before. I've talked about this on many different occasions, if you've been paying attention, which you have. And I talked about it recently also on Twitter. I put out a few tweets last week to the effect, basically, that if you're a man in this society, you can't expect anyone to help you except you, really. Because nobody wants to help you. Nobody wants to see you succeed. You don't belong to the protected class. You don't belong to the special snowflake class. No one is going to go out of their way to help you, to extend you a helping hand, to do anything for you. In fact, they're actively going to try to oppose you. Not only, not only do they not want you to have a dollar, they don't even want you to have a nickel. They don't even want you to have a nickel. Because your very presence as a masculine man makes them uncomfortable. Your presence, when you go about about your life, when you do your thing, when you go about conducting business in the real world on a day-to-day basis, if you you find yourself having to go out and mix and you're looking your best, being your best, if you have taken care of your body, you dress well, You're going to get a certain amount of hate just by being what you are. People don't like that. And this is what is so, I think, contemptible about uh, about modern American society is that they want you to be a loser. You know, all of those people out there that you run into, deep down, you remind them of their shortcomings. You remind them of their inadequacies of their failures, of their negligence, of their laziness, of their slothfulness, of their unwillingness to do anything to try to better themselves. And so that's something that you have to accept. You have to already know, going into it, how that die has been cast. But you have to give it right back. You need to return their hate with just as much hate on your side. You don't return hate with love. That comes when you're 80 years old. You need to respond in a dignified, polite way. And I don't mean physically respond. I don't mean respond by shooting your mouth off. I mean just by being the best that you can be. You have to carry that chip on your shoulder. You have to understand that you're not imagining it. Because... You're not part of the protected classes anymore. Not only do they not want you to succeed, they actively hate you. They actively hate you. It's, you're not imagining it. You're not imagining it. You know, I was just reading, oh, I think it was maybe yesterday, that, or maybe it was today, that these Koch brothers, you know, these super rich plutocrat, scum of the earth, set aside, I think, something like a $400 million fund to dole out to congressmen and senators who opposed the the, the, the Trump health care quote-unquote reform. Now, let me make myself clear. I'm not even a fan of Trump's healthcare reform. I come from the school of thought that I think we should be like every other country in the world. We should have some form of universal 
single-payer health system like every other country in the world because I believe that every government has a minimum level of responsibility for the health and welfare of its citizens. That's just not even controversial. That's just, just a, a fact. Now, the, the parameters of how that all would shake out or how that would work, I don't know, really. I don't, I don't have all the details. But I sure as hell know that the system that we have now is a complete travesty. It's broken. It's a disaster. It's unaffordable. You've got the super rich opting out. And you have the people on the bottom not paying anything because they just they don't they don't pay anything anyway. So the middle class continues to get squeezed and ground down to nothing and destroyed, which is part of the plan, which is part of the plutocratic insurgency that I talked about earlier. But in any case, we need something. We need something to bring us along the lines up to the same level of coverage that every other country in the world has. That's not going to be perfect. I'm not saying that everybody deserves Rolls Royce level care, but everyone everyone should have something. They should have access to something. And they should not have to go bankrupt by just taking on the most rudimentary of health care needs. And that's just a fact. And anyone that thinks otherwise is either too young to know, understand the difference or hasn't traveled, hasn't seen what is available in other parts of the developed world. But in any case, in any case, these two uh, Koch brothers setting aside money essentially to give out, to dole out to people, to dole out to candidates for office if you vote the way they want you to do. Now just think about that. Think about that. These are two colossally rich venal venal arrogant who begrudge the, the who, who begrudge people even having basic health care needs they don't even want you to have the most basic of health care needs they not only they not only want to repeal the obamacare plan but they don't e- they don't even want the trump plan which is even weaker than than what obama's was they don't want anything they don't want you to have anything that's the real nature of this beast it's just it's it's so despicable it's so uh it's so shocking to the conscience you don't even know where to begin you know and you say to yourself how do these people even look at themselves in the mirror in the morning how do you how do you tell somebody that oh you don't you don't you don't, you have nothing you know we don't believe in anything or we're going to give you some tax credit for 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 having a a terminal illness and the people here actually rose to the occasion for once. I was surprised. I mean, there were actually demonstrations out demonstrating against this new proposed bill. For once, people are starting to vote in their own self-interest. After 40 years of being plundered by the plutocrats, people are finally, finally, I think, beginning to wake up. I mean, it's, the game is almost over. They've pretty much lost almost everything, but at least there's some glimmer of hope on the horizon here. But in any case, think about this. You've got super rich people essentially bribing elected officials, bribing elected officials to vote the way they want them to vote. I mean, this is just, this is unprecedented. It's, it, it passes without comment because it's considered normal. But in any healthy society, people like that you know, would be too ashamed even to show their faces. These are people who probably pay next to nothing in taxes, who exempt themselves out from all social responsibility. And they think that by throwing money around that they can buy people. And to some extent they can. But... What do you think Teddy Roosevelt would have done to people like that? He would have said, you have a social responsibility to your fellow man in this society. And if you don't start behaving in a socially responsible way, guess what? I'm going to confiscate half of your holdings and we're going to make you behave in a socially responsible way. You don't want to behave the right way. We're going to make you behave in the right way. 
And this is what they need to hear. This is what needs to happen at some point. You need to hit people hard sometimes. People need to be hit hard. When someone is an oppressor, a criminal, a liar, a scum of the earth, they need to be responded to. And that's really what I'm getting at. And you can take this lesson and you can internalize it and use it in your day-to-day life, in your day-to-day struggles. And I think you'll find that it's a sound principle. Not always, not in every situation, of course, like anything else, but sound nevertheless. And along these lines, along these lines, to kind of read you an entertaining story that ties into what I'm talking about. I'm going to read you a passage from my book that's going to be coming out this summer, probably June, end of June, July, depending on some factors. But uh, this is going to be my translation of Sallust, uh, the the Roman historian Sallust's uh, Conspiracy of Catiline and War of Jugurtha. And let me tell you, this is going to be a very, very exciting book. And I think you're going to enjoy it a great deal. And trust me when I tell you, it's going to knock your bloody socks off. A lot of, lot of great stuff in here. It's going to have everything. We're going to have, uh, we're going to have uh, uh, descriptive introductions, descriptions of the Roman political and military system, uh, topical organization tables, chronologies, maps, Um, a completely annotated text of 300 footnotes that describe every possible thing in the text that could cause confusion so that someone with no prior background or experience in the subject matter can just pick up the book and just get all the value they need out of it. And these are thrilling stories, thrilling, exciting stories. Some of the best battle descriptions of ancient combat are found in Sallust in the War of Jugurtha. And when I talk about hitting your opponent hard, I was reminded of an incident in the War of Jugurtha where the Roman consul who's conducting a military expedition in the wilds of Numidia, uh, a region of North Africa that's now um, Tunisia, And Marius, or Marius, as we would say in Latin, has come under attack by his enemies. And these enemies were Numidians and also some Moors, Maori in Latin, and Gaetulians, which was a a Berber tribe of North Africa. And he was put to flight. He was attacked. the, the, The enemy attacked Marius and put him to flight, took him off balance. And he had to retreat temporarily. He had to make way, retreat, and he had to withdraw his forces to two elevations, two hills that were close by to lick his wounds and to come back strong. And sometimes that's what you have to do in this life. If you get hit hard, if you're hurting, you got to temporarily retire to safe ground, lick your wounds, and then come back strong, and then hit them hard. Hit them hard. Hit them hard and keep hitting them until they recognize that they need to bend to your will. So that's what this selection that I'm going to read is going to be about. Marius has been essentially put to flight from the field of battle by his enemies, the Gaetulians and Moors. And then he comes back and attacks them. They become complacent. They become satisfied. They become arrogant. They let their guard down. And then he takes advantage of that and smashes them. And and this is what you have to do. This is the type of posture you need to adopt in your day-to-day life. Let the enemy be arrogant. Let them spin their wheels. Let them shoot their mouths off. Let them say what they will say. And you quietly bide your time 
and then you come back strong. And then, by God, you hit them. You hit them hard. Hit them with everything you have. And keep hitting them. Keep hitting them and go right through them. And don't stop. So let me here read this selection or this passage here from the my translation of the War of Jugurtha. Jugurtha, as we would say in Latin, but if we anglicize the name, we can just say Jugurtha. And this is um, section chapter chapter ninety eight of War War of Jugurtha. Uh, where we where we start the selection here. And Sallust says, Deriving his next move from the disposition of forces on the ground and needing a location where his men could retreat, Marius occupied two hills that were close together. One of these hills was not large enough to accommodate a camp, but had a large spring of water. The other hill was suitable for his purpose because it was generally steep and elevated, thus needing little fortification. He ordered Sulla to position himself by the spring during the night with the cavalry. Marius himself gradually pieced together his dispersed soldiers, no less disoriented from all the enemy attacks, and fast-marched them to the hill. Thus the two kings, compelled by the difficulties presented by Marius's position, were deterred from continuing the battle. Nevertheless, they did not permit their men to go too far away. Setting up scattered camps, they surrounded both hills with a huge number of men. Finally, after building a sea of bonfires, the barbarians, as is their custom, spent most of the night in celebration. They were ecstatic, shouting at the top of their lungs. Even their arrogant leaders acted as if they had already won simply because they had not fled the battlefield. But from their elevated position in the darkness, the Romans could see all of this quite clearly, and it greatly aided their resolution. Marius was very much reassured by the enemy's inexperience in the ways of war. He gave strict instructions that his men should keep as quiet as possible, not even to sound off when it was time to replace the night watches. Then, as daylight approached, and with the enemy worn out and overtaken by sleep, he suddenly ordered the men standing watch and the horn blowers of the legions, squadrons, and cohorts to blast out a signal all at once, and for the soldiers to scream war cries as they burst out of the camp's gates. The Moors and Gaetulians, suddenly awakened and confused by the terrible noises, were unable to flee, take up arms, help each other, or do anything at all. Amid the roar of battle, the shouting, the feeling of helplessness, the disorder, the panic, and the sheer velocity of the Roman attack, something like madness gripped them all. In the end, they were crushed and routed. Most of their military standards and weapons were captured. More of the enemy was slain in this battle than in all others that had preceded it, for their escape had been hindered by sleep and by the terror that came without warning. So that's a passage from Sallust, from my book that will appear this summer. And that's just one of, of many, many, many exciting passages. And we haven't even gotten to his psychological profiles yet of the characters that appear in his histories that offer and afford us even greater lessons and observations. But the point of that passage was how you can turn defeat into victory. We saw in that passage that Marius and his men were confined to, hi to two hills. They had been routed from the field by an enemy that outnumbered them, that was arrogant. They were surrounded and com confined on these two hills. But their enemies, instead of finishing them off, spent the night carousing, drinking, celebrating in front of bonfires. And... They wasted away the night in partying so that when dawn came, they were exhausted and worn out. And Marius had watched all of this from his position on top of the hill. And as Sallust said, he's, he was greatly reassured by seeing all of this. And he used it to his advantage by crushing the enemies and escaping 
from the predicament that he was placed in. And so the lesson is, use your enemy's arrogance to your advantage. Hit them hard. Hit them hard, keep hitting them, and continue to hit them. Because remember, the only one that cares about you is you. No one is going to help you. We are living in a time now when the plutocrats, a class that I talked about in one of my last podcasts on the plutocratic insurgency, these people actively want to destroy us. They, they envision a society where they're the mandarins, as in ancient China, and you're just the lowly serf peon who is fit only to kiss their rings and polish their shoes. They don't want you to have a fair shake at anything. That's their vision of society. And we can thank the irresponsibility, the greed, the venality, and the cowardice of our leaders for the past 30, 40 years for putting us in the situation that we're in now. But that's the situation that we're in right now. I wish it wasn't this way. I wish I could tell you it was different. But it isn't different. You're not imagining it. It really is as bad as you think it is. So now is the time to stand up, to not compromise, to not back down one inch from an arrogant and capricious enemy. Don't back down one inch. Be the best you can be. Be all you can be. Don't be a loser to make other people feel good. Don't become demoralized. Don't believe the lies when they tell you that you're not worth anything. Don't you believe the foolishness or the bullshit when they tell you that you're some oppressor. No, they're the oppressors. They're the ones who need to answer for what they've done. And if there ever is an honest reckoning, they will answer for what they've done. If there ever is an honest reckoning. So that will wrap up this podcast on hitting them hard. And we'll talk again soon. I'm Quintus Curtius. Good night.